Everybody, welcome to another episode of the Fair Chase Podcast. Before we start this episode, we're going to again take a little time to thank a little bit of the people who helped make this show possible. First up is 2O Gear. Uh, it's a new brand that we just started partnering with. Uh, they make awesome uh, high-end technical uh, hunting clothes, camo. Um, and so they're based in Michigan yep. and a uh, new company. We've tested them for months. I tested them uh, in the whitetail season last year. Great Merino base layers. Yep. Great awesome Merino shells. Base. Yep. Awesome a, new pattern. A great system for going out west, but we'll use it a ton in the, in the whitetail woods too. So really excited to work with them. 2ogear.com. Go check them out. Next up is Worldwide Trophy Adventures. Uh, it's it's an awesome, uh, basically, connection to outfitters all over the world. So as a lot of people know, good hunting ground is really hard to come by. And um, oftentimes, the best way to ensure that you're going to get in a good spot or you may, maybe you need to legally have a guide is to, to go through an outfitter. Mm -hmm. um, and so... As you might know, if you've heard us before, we've had good experiences and bad experiences with outfitters, uh, which means, you know, in order to ensure you're going to have a good experience, you have to do a ton of research. You have to talk to people. It's just a lot of messing around. Worldwide Trophy Adventures, or WTA, does a lot of this work for you at no charge. So by booking your trip through WTA, you can rest assured that you'll be in a good location with a reputable outfitter um, that they've certified and endorsed. If you're looking to book a trip of a lifetime like I am, mm -hmm. uh, just headed to a moose hunt here through WTA, you're going to want to check them out. Uh, go give them a call. Actually, I have the number right here. It's 1-800-346-8747 or check out their website at WorldwideTrophyAdventures.com. All right, so we love Trophy Line. They offer more than just saddles. Believe it or not, they have their own climbing sticks. They've got platforms. They've got a ton of extra packs. Gear. They've got packs. They've got everything. Knee pads. Everything that you're going to need to be a saddle hunter, they have it. So if you want to start saddle hunting this year and get into the game like everyone else and really love hunting even more, go to Trophy Line, check it out, use the code TFC10 to save yourself 10% on that purchase. We're big bow hunters. Uh, sights, quivers, stabilizers, those kind of things are really important if you're going to have a deadly setup. Um, and so we've tried a lot of different companies in the industry, and we've kind of figured out that we really like Redline gear the best. So um, we are shooting their torch sights this yeah, year. It's a, re it's a really, cool, really cool sight. Very, there's a lot of good micro adjustments you can make. You mm -hmm. can customize a lot of the stuff on there, really make it your own. The chargeable USB rechargeable yeah, light is really sweet. Cool. Um, and so we're huge fans of their stuff. We use them all the time. It's worth going to check them out. Uh, check out Redline. Use the promo code TFC10 for 10% off your purchase. And uh, let us know what you think. We love them. Hey, everybody. Glad to have you back for another episode of the Fair Chase podcast. Before we dive in, um, just reminding you of this special Christensen Arms promo. So if you're gearing up for hunting season, first of all, it's September. You, you should probably start getting it moving. But um, but I wanted to tell you about this offer that can get you up to $750 worth of gear. This promotion is brought to you, like I said, from our good friends at Christensen Arm. So if you don't know, they are actually the ones that made the first carbon fiber barrel back in 1995. Jordan was just a wee little baby uh, when that happened. Still wet in his pants and, um, you know, sipping on that bottle. Uh, but they've been making uh, world-class rifles ever since. So now, from now, through October 31st, when you buy an eligible Christensen Arms rifle, I have one, by the way. I shoot the 300 Win Mag. Uh, we're going to talk about that in a few episodes here. But basically, it's an awesome rifle. But when you get one, you send in a form. You can find it on their website uh, with your original receipt. Uh, and so when they verify your purchase, they'll send you this gift card. So you can use this gift card in their online store. It's seven hundred and fifty dollars worth. Um, so you have things for like accessories for your rifle. You can also spend it on things like uh, Leopold Mystery Ranch gear, Half Face Blades, Uncharted Supply Company. Quick note on them: uh, we've had their founder on for a few times, and he's he's a really cool guy. But and they make really cool stuff. So a lot of things you can spend it on. So go to ChristiansonArms.com, learn more about this cool offer, and get yourself not only a rifle but a cool cool gear as well. Um, and so with that in mind, I want to dive into uh, an interesting podcast that, that uh, I've had planned for a while. Uh, I, uh, I'll, I'll give you a little background before we, we jump into it. But about a month ago, sitting at my home, minding my own business, and I get a call from our friends at 
uh, WTA Worldwide Trophy Adventures, uh, letting me know they have a cancellation hunt coming up for a moose hunt in British Columbia and asking if I would be interested in going and filming it, um, going on a moose hunt in British Columbia, filming it, helping them kind of tell other people about um, kind of the amazing stuff that they do. Uh, they're basically just for anybody who doesn't know Worldwide Trophy Adventures is almost like a like a, it's like a booking agency. Essentially, you you go to them and tell them, hey, you know, I'm uh, looking for a hunt. I want to maybe hunt elk, mule deer, whatever. Or I've got this much money or whatever. I want to either start planning and building up points, which they'll help you manage points and, and be really smart about where you build points to get drawn in places, or they'll help you with uh, specific hunts with outfitters. And so awesome group. Uh, their, uh, their founder, Mark Peterson's based here close to us in West Michigan. So got talking to them and, and they had asked us to go. So of course uh, that came up and I was almost instantly was down in, in for it. Uh, very little time to prepare, but it was during a time where I thought, you know, I'd be elk hunting in Montana anyways with cow tag. So I was like, well, I got the time off. I'm going to need a little bit more extra time for this hunt, but work was cool about it. So like last minute, I'm like, all right, I'm in. So I'm easy to do uh, because I've got, I already had a pile of hunting stuff and I was already game. But the other side of that was we need to film it. And so what I did was um, get a hold of our guest here, Jordan Parham, uh, Parham for some of you. And uh, he's uh, a guy we've known for a while. We, we did a, a bear hunt with him, filmed it. It will be, sounds like it'll be out now, um, Q1 of next year, probably the spring end of Q1. Um, but yeah, called him up and Jordan, like the, the cool guy he is, was also down pretty much instantly. And so uh, before we dive into the story and everything else, Jordan, like just introduce yourself, say hi to the world. This is your first time on camera, not behind the camera for us. Yeah, first podcast too, you know, so yeah. Uh, Jordan Parham, uh, videographer, photographer, been doing this uh, freelance for seven years. Uh, this is only the second real hunt that we've uh, we've worked together on. So, and I'm not a big hunter myself. So this is actually like only the third hunt I've been on, and the first one being our Wisconsin hunt a long time ago. And it seems like every one of those has been an absolute insane adventure, and just. <laughs> It's just the craziest of hunts, so um, very cool. But been doing uh, yeah. been doing studio work for professionally now for four years, and been loving that and getting a lot of uh, getting a lot of <clears throat> getting a lot of experience with uh, with these big brands and talking to uh, yeah. a lot of marketing people and really understanding what people are looking for. So, so this has been a cool time yeah, to kind of connect with with these new brands in the outdoor space. <laughs> yeah, we've, I got to give you credit. I mean, for a guy who has no background in hunting, like for everybody who, who doesn't know, and we, we've posted about this in the past, there's a cool clip of Jared shooting a buck on the ground. Uh, but like when we first met Jordan, I met through somebody I had worked with and, you know, basically like, Hey, you want to go to Wisconsin and hunt with us? He had never hunted before goes out. And like, we go out there and like, we get there, it's like 50 degrees, you know, it's end of October. Um, and while we're there, it snows like, I don't know. 10 inches or some ridiculous amount drops to like, at one point it was in the negative degree range. We're, we're sleeping in a, a teepee with a stove, but it was like, Oh, here, here's your first hunting adventure. So like, as far as like whitetail hunts in the Midwest, it was like as extreme as it gets, you know, we wait a few years kind of, you know, we didn't film much, um, call them back up this spring and you were randomly down to do a boat based bear hunt in Alaska. So why not just jump right in there? And, and this one was, uh, a, um, well, last minute hunt in British Columbia. The, the unique thing about it was, and what I give you a huge credit for is this wasn't just like any hunt where you fly in and yet you, you do the thing. I, I find out from uh, that most people that, that go to British Columbia uh, don't bring meat back with uh, them. So you fly in, you shoot it, you, you ship the head home. If you get one, you donate the meat to the guides and the, the locals. And that's great and everything uh, for for most people, and I, I totally understand it, but I was not in for that. I wanted to uh, to bring the meat home. So when it comes to last minute prep, one of the last minute pieces of preparation that we had to figure out was like, all right, I guess that means we drive. And this, it was a 46, seven hour drive there and 46, seven hour drive back. 
Um, and with stops and sleeping, sleepovers and everything, Jordan basically spent like a hundred hours in the car with me <laughs> over two, two stints. Um, but, but, but a lot of it was, um, how do we get the meat back? And, and so what we opted to do was, um, in the back of the truck, load up a freezer and a generator, a chest freezer and a generator. And, uh, which was interesting, but, um, so, so there's that component and I'll get to that in a little bit, but, you know, Jordan, when I called you, um, you know, you're, you're getting gear together and planning for this when it comes to like gear that you are kind of preparing for, like for people who are maybe camera people that are listening to this or want to know a little bit more about how you prepared, um, what, what was your approach to it? Like, how did you, how did you get gear together? Um, what did you do? Yeah, well. I kind of kept the same kit. I mean, we were right off the heels of Alaska, so I definitely kept the same kit that we shot with. Uh, I ran it a little bit longer of a lens. So basically, I went in with a primary video camera, and I was shooting on a Blackmagic uh, Pocket 6K Pro and with an 18 to 35 on that. And that's pretty much what we shot 99% of Alaska with. Actually, that's what we shot 100% of Alaska with because <laughs> our other camera didn't make it too long. And that's 99% of what we shot um, this British Columbia with. And the only thing we used with the long lens was, you know, our, our moose kill shot. And that was the intention of that. And so the other idea is, you know, we're shooting photo as well. So brought two Canon cameras with me and just brought a 24 to 70 and a 100 to 500. And then the other aspect you really have to think about was, you know, battery power, like that was our big hurdle for me was yeah yeah if we're out there in the middle of british columbia and we don't have power how can i manage battery across all these different systems because we had we also had two gopros so it was you know none of these batteries are compatible with each other so it was bringing enough battery power for our main camera and the photo cameras and the gopros and that was that was the biggest challenge ahead of time was just loading up on on fresh batteries, charging everything up and just hoping we have some sort of power solution. We're out there. All right. We're going to take a pause here real quick and just thank a few more guys and companies that help make this show possible. First up is Vortex. We can't say it enough. We love their glass. We love their binoculars, spotting scopes, range finders, their apparel. James, James is rocking a nice little hoodie here. They make awesome stuff. And if you guys are looking to make a purchase at Vortex, go over to their website, and use the code TFC20 to save yourself 20% on the next purchase. That's a big, good discount. Use it. Head over there and get something. A bow makes a man. Does and, it? Yeah, that's what I was told. And we're we're big fans of, of Prime Bows. Shooting it for years. Michigan-based company. Uh, we're shooting their latest Revix series of bows. Mine's that 36 long boy. I'll generally year. take a few shots right back here and just... Yeah. Yeah, we, we're a huge fan. Smooth, uh, great balance. Um, they're, they're just go check them out. There's tons of technology. One of my favorite things that they have is their grip. Mm. Uh, space age space technology age. keeps your hand warm even when it's cold. Um, highly recommend go check out Prime Archery. Finally, Lathrop and Sons. Boots. Your feet kill animals. Like the more you walk, the more chances you have at, at getting that big buck, that big elk moose, whatever it is. Uh, Lathrop and Sons have been kind of our go-to boot of choice for a while now. Uh, we've put in a lot of miles, taken them all over the place. There's no leaking. It's comfortable. Stephen and James there, like, spent – they're, like, foot like, they're scientists. Ge they're geniuses. I got messed up feet, and they basically will – you know, you take an imprint of your foot. They'll look at it, look at your arch, how wide it is, how narrow, how long, and they literally build the boot around your foot. So you're not going to a box store – and picking up something that you hope is going to fit your boot. These things actually are tailor-made to your foot. So they're super comfortable. Mine, I could I could walk all day in them. So if, if, if you're looking to and get a have. boot. If, <laughs> I have. If you're looking for a boot that's made for you and not somebody else, go check out Lake Turbine Sons. What was your uh, – so obviously, uh, just spoiler, we, it turned out we had a generator in camp, which was a game changer. But we planned on not having that. What, what was your – what was your plan for yeah. batteries? Should that not have been there? Yeah, the plan. So we ended up, I ended up buying a, a battery bank, a decent one. It was uh, an Echo brand. And then we bought uh, we bought some pretty big solar panels. And it was, they were big enough where they would power the pack for a, a long time and uh, charge everything up while we were hunting. 
and then when I come back, the, the battery bank will be full and I would have enough power to just start charging batteries. If we didn't get any sun, I could have powered uh, eight full charges on my main camera, which would have been well over enough of what we needed. You know, in hindsight, looking back, I think we would have made it with just the batteries I had bought without even having to charge anything fresh. But, but yeah, we ended up going the solar route, went back and forth on that, and that seemed to be the play. So kind of yeah that was sweet I, yeah, yeah go ahead i'm gonna say kind of disappointed we didn't get to use it you know i want to see it out there in the field but once we heard that there was a, a generator out there i mean it was just that made life way easier yeah and we had reached out to a few folks max benz who did one of joe's films and does a lot of the first light and, and those guys of stuff and um and and actually matt uh, who did um, a lot of HuntWise stuff back when he was at HuntWise too. So we talked to some people and it, it, I'm glad that the battery packs would work. But like you said, I, I really wanted to see how that uh, that um, solar power panel stuff would, would be uh, kind of in the field. Uh, but, uh, you know, I just want to say, I, I got to give you more credit thinking about it when you, you mentioned your, your video camera. So two things. So not only are you with a back, as we're hiking around, you're carrying a lot of camera stuff in your backpack, which I want to ask you about in a minute but you're carrying in your hand, your video camera as we're climbing up stuff. So you're like, you're like hauling a fairly heavy piece of equipment up and down um, some pretty steep hills at one, one of the spots that we would really glass from was about a thousand foot, I think 800 to a thousand foot climb. Um, at one point you're in four wheel drive, like you're using hands and, and uh, feet for, for climbing up like a bear up, up the, uh, the side of this hill. Um, but on top of that, you had basically, had just had COVID. Like you were literally like the day before we left, not contagious according to the whoever. And so like you were not only carrying like a backpack worth of gear and this camera in your hands, but also you got had the, the you were a lunger. You had the COVID lung while we were doing that. How are you feeling now? Is that lung better? <laughs> you know, I feel great now. Like I feel like I can actually breathe. But uh yeah, it didn't help at the uh, the tail end of that probably catching dysentery you know that's really what i'm working through now <laughs> oh yeah so we ended with <laughs> we ended with the drive back not only was it a 47 hour drive back but we were uh we were definitely uh stopping a few times so uh because jo jordan kept having blowouts in uh bad places like uh you are you better are you are we so just again one other thing is we literally got in last night we were going to record in the car decided we were too exhausted got a good night's sleep but like we we're just back so this is our first time talking since we got back yeah you know i still i still can't really stomach a ton of food i mean i don't have any appetite at all really but for the most part i think i'm better i think it's it's worked its way through i, I i'm guessing dysentery based off how quick it all started and kind of how it tailed off there so not the uh not the experience i wanted for a 50 hour car ride yeah yeah because it yeah that was rough I, I was feeling so bad i was like should i you know i was trying to drive you're a trooper i was trying to drive for you and you were like willing to drive and you're doing all the things and at one point you went to the gas station and brought bought this uh three pack where there was two meat uh two cheese sticks and a meat stick in the middle and i remember just thinking like you know what? Like, I can't, I don't even, I can't, I don't even know what to say about that. That's the boldness that while you have, you know, the, the loose stools, uh, you're just eating stuff that would probably give me the loose stools anyways. That was, yeah, that was, I was blown away. That was a bold move. Uh, I think it paid off. <laughs> I mean, what really came in yeah. clutch was British Columbia with their outhouse rest areas, you know, every, every five kilometers, it seemed. I mean, without those, that would have been a, that would have been a different trip. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, actually. Okay. So I, I was meaning to ask, go one other cool thing is, and um, the outfitter we were with, and just so everybody knows, we're going to recap this actual hunt story in a little bit with Jared and Joe um, talking about the hunt we had that we haven't, we, we told them we, we were successful. We'll, we're posting this online. So it's no surprise, but, um, and it will be filmed and this film will, will be ready probably November ish. Um, but we'll, we'll recap the actual hunt, but we're, we're doing background stuff for, for this hunt because, um, I realized that there's not a lot of information about this type of stuff out there. Um, so when we were in camp talking to the outfitter, he, or the, the our guide Dawson, uh, who is one of the coolest guys I've ever hunted with. Um, he was like, man, that's, I've never seen that backpack before that you're carrying your camera gear on. Uh, like talk, talk about that, that backpack. Yeah. So I, I think that's a cool thing. It's actually right there behind me. It's, 
it's a f stop bag if uh most people should recognize that name in the camera world that's kind of like that's a top tier brand and that i think is their biggest bag they make it's a shin i'm pretty sure it's an 80 liter bag uh it's got all the inserts and everything for for camera protection and i opted to to buy that bag when we went to alaska because i knew i wanted to i wanted to bring a ton of gear with me i wanted it all protected but you know i wanted that hiking frame still uh definitely not a cheap bag you know i'm not sure what hunting bags run but i mean that bag was like a thousand dollars so but with the uh with the material it's made out of you know keeps a lot of the rain out and comes with that shell which definitely saved a lot of my gear you know especially on our hunt on our last hunt here you know the one day we got rain you know that was our that was our big day of production and i think that bag and came in super clutch and for getting camera gear in and out you know it opens from the back and uh it was just able to the back being like what touches your back oh yeah for sure yeah so yeah you you pop it off with the rain shell on and set it on the ground and and then you just unzip the back and you got all the access to your camera gear like your traditional bag but it just comes in that hunting frame uh definitely something probably wouldn't take on a on a goat hunt you know probably would opt to to buy a different bag and kind of really trim the gear down but yeah, it needs to be said that, you know, that bag was, was definitely heavy. Uh, that was like, <laughs> I, I wish we would have weighed it, but I'm guessing that was close to, you know, 55, 60 pounds. Like that bag was, that was, a uh, that was brutal, but, yeah. but it was, you know, I wanted access to all that stuff and yeah, I think it really paid off. So, oh dude, well, I mean, even the moment of truth, you were able to get multiple uh, angles. We, we were up close and personal for our our kit like for the kill and, and that whole thing so to have you with the ability to pop up a tripod a long lens video camera and your your handheld camera it was i mean the foot it just i cannot wait to show you everybody's footage i mean it's incredible incredible how it went down and just the fact that you were carrying that around was worth it uh, in the end so um that was that was pretty cool yeah um so we covered, uh, I mean, camera stuff is huge. The, the, uh, the big things for us were obviously getting camera ready, getting the, the freezer set and getting across the border. Like those were some of our biggest, like logistical hurdles, uh, for us. And this is why I wanted to record it uh, after we got into the U S cause I was like, it might not work. You know, we basically what happened was we get there. We're like, all right, we're taking the meat home. Our outfitter was like, well, we don't recommend taking the meat home and the head home yourself. He was trying to get us to ship it. And I'm like, no, Christian from actually Uncharted, uh, who I just talked about a minute ago, had done a similar trip across the border. And he said it was very doable. He had done it with a, 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 um, a Jenner. I don't think he did a Jenner. I think he plugged it into his truck, but with a freezer and everything anyways. So, but, but a big part of it was like getting that skull clean enough just in case they, you know, they want to check for first, you know, brains in the skull and everything else carrying CWD, getting the generator working to to power the freezer to freeze the meat as we're driving um which worked basically what we did was you know we we take that super cub in we do our hunting we do a bunch of trips out with the super cub um and uh load up the freezer to the brim we we we, uh man i gotta think i I unloaded it last night jordan i gotta think we're 300 plus pounds of meat boned out meat um And we didn't even take the front two shoulders. I couldn't fit them in. So uh, the guide, our guide got one and our pilot, I gave the other one to the pilot because I figured the the plane ride out was a little dicey and I'm not a big plane feller. Uh, And so just, I felt like he he really, keeping me not dead uh, in pretty pretty nasty winds, uh, he he earned himself a shoulder. So, um, but we basically got the meat in, loaded it up pull started that generator almost immediately um he had it plugged in by the time we got there too so it was a little cold in the freezer but we drove the 47 hours every time we were driving as as long as we were driving we had that generator running it was a four gallon tank and it was i mean i was i was actually blown away how it didn't run out of gas so much like we hardly ever really filled it up filled it up yeah that plan i was a little nervous about it you know and when we were driving there i i voiced that concern about driving with the generator (laughs) on the road for that long, but I, I am really surprised at how well that worked. I mean, like you said, we never ran out of gas. And when we plugged it in at night at the hotels, I mean, that plan, that plan came together. That was perfect. I don't know if it would work every time. Like I, I was always like some, some little 
you know, kid or something's going to unplug it in the night, some hooligan, you oh, know, yeah. or mess around with the meat. I don't know, you know. Oh, yeah. I definitely had that concern at the hotel. Somebody would just follow that trail, that cord back to the truck and just start digging around. And for, yeah, for no exactly. reason at all, would just take the meat out, you know. Just to be a little shit. Yeah. yeah. Well, I know what's funny is my my personal freezer is, I have a big one. It wouldn't fit in the truck. So I got my brother's who he got, he got that from my grandparents. My grandpa died by grandma moved into the home and we got, he got her old freezer. So that freezer that we brought was, that's an old free, that's an old freezer that probably, uh, you know, my grandparents would have never have expected that it would end up in British Columbia and, and back. Um. So it, it worked. I mean, we threw it in there. The generator ran real well. Uh, we got the skull clean. So basically you, you, you make the kill. And I spent a, a, almost an entire, like I probably spent at least four hours, at least four hours cleaning that skull. And I went back a bunch of times, scraping it out, trying to get every little beat, a bit of meat out um, and then salted it for a few days. And then it sat out for a few days and, you know, salted again and, um, you know, brought it threw it in the truck and uh then it sat next to a generator running which probably dried it out nice it was in the sun and the wind so i, I think i mean i think it, it went really well and what basically what happened was um you make a kill in british columbia you bring it to get a uh i keep thinking wanting to say it's a compulsory inspection i want to see i i can't compulsory that word i kept forgetting but it's a ci or compulsory inspection um and so uh we, you know, we went and saw the guy about that. It's it's something you have to do in British Columbia. He checks it out. He he marks a bunch of information, fills out a sheet, gives it to you. Um, and then we made our drive to the border. Uh, we stopped on the right before we got across, and it was in Portal, North Dakota. And we see another wild game check station. And this was like Saskatchewan uh, fishing game. I don't necessarily think that was required for us to stop at, but I didn't know. So I just like showed up and showed him my paper and they are like, they, it took them a while because they had never seen it before. They didn't know British Columbia laws. And looking back, I'm like, I don't think I needed to stop for them, but I didn't know. It was literally like a hundred yards before the border. So I thought maybe this is like a Canadian thing. And so I didn't know, but I, I got it double checked out and, um, what was interesting is, you know, you, you, when you roll into Canada, you, you fill out a form, they look at your rifle. It's a, th it's in person. We, you know, it was, it was a little bit of a thing, but not too bad. When we got to a, uh, going back into the States, you know, you, you drive up, they ask you, you know, all the questions and they said, you, would you like to declare a firearm or uh, the transportation of wild game? So I'm like, yes, yes. Uh, I had filled out forms ahead of time, a 55, 47, or there's a, there's a certain form you have to fill out and you go to, um, Prior to leaving for this trip, I had to go to uh, uh, like a U.S. office to get that set. Um, but when I when I get there, it's like they're like, all right, pull around the corner, go in this door C, you know, go fill out a form. And literally, they didn't look at a rifle. They didn't even look at the skull. They didn't look at anything. Now, it, the only time reason it took so long is because I took so long to fill out the form because I was nervous about something being wrong. And so I hand them the form and they're like, well we're going to hand this into fish and wildlife. If they have any questions, they're going to give you a call. So I'm sitting at my desk right here. I just, I've got it sitting right here. I've got all my papers just in case they, they have any questions, but man, for as much as like our outfitter, the owner of the outfit was like, you can't get it across. They're going to take your skull away from you. He like discouraged it. And I'm like, Oh, I know somebody who did. I'm just going to, I think I'll do it rather than pay like two grand to ship a skull that I'm just going to Euro mount on my wall. It's not like I'm doing like a, you know, a shoulder mount or anything with it. I'm going to take the chance. And I'm so, so glad I did because that would have been not cheap. Yeah, man. Everybody kind of scared us out of the idea. So I'm really glad you stuck with it. You know, that was a good learning experience. I think for everybody. And if you have any concern about getting into Canada, you know, go through portal. That was small. Portal North Dakota. It was baby. not busy. Uh, I think the only thing, I think if those conservation officers, saw us driving by with a big, you know, moose rack in the back, they probably would have got a little butt hurt that we didn't stop. So yeah. I think we did the right thing there, but, but yeah, I don't think we needed to talk to them. No. And we, most of the drive, we drove with it covered with a tarp, tarp in um, Canada. So coming from British Columbia through Alberta, through Saskatchewan, like it was pretty much covered up with some little tines hanging out here and there. And 
but once we got to the U.S., I'm like, I can't. The tarp keeps coming off. I'm not messing with it. So it was just hanging out. So we're cracking up because, like, every time we stop, whether we are in Canada or the U.S., someone comes and like talks to us about this giant moose head in the back seat. But like when we're in the states, you know, it's just hanging out. And so I don't. I was. I, my guess is close to fifty. I would say almost every car. Most cars that passed us waved or gave us like the one of these. What is that? Hang 10. That's that's, that's what that I, I didn't know what to do. I, I was doing this to people. I figured. Oh, you're doing one of these I, like rock on. Is that rock on? Okay. I don't know. I don't What's know. this then? Is that Spider-Man? I think that's I love you and sign language. I should have done that. I love yeah. you guys. But yeah, we definitely were getting lots of love and you know, it was pretty cool. I'm not gonna lie. I like driving and people uh, giving me the thumbs up on the way. That was that was cool to the point where if somebody drove by and they didn't give me the thumbs up, I'd be like, dude, what's wrong with you people? You know, do you not see yeah. the moose in the back? Like, which we, we stopped. It was so funny. We stopped at the Oak Brook mall near the Oak Brook mall in Chicago, which is like, a, I mean, yuppie ish. And like I, we stopped at actually a whole food, whole foods parking lot. So I run in to get us some supplies. We need our, our uh, kombucha supply for, for a trip like this. And like, I'm just cracking up because I'm pretty sure everybody that we passed has never seen a moose in the back of a pickup truck in, uh, in oh, like the Oak Brook Mall area. And so uh, it's, of course, like even then some guy and his wife stopped by and she was real interested. But Jordan pointed out that like maybe we emasculated that dude a little bit because his first question was for me was, where did you find that? I'm like, well, I didn't find the dead moose in the woods. Like I definitely made it dead. Uh you know so like you're kind of tipping your your hand like you're, you're showing your hand a little bit like you're definitely like your your lady here is not impressed with your manliness yeah yeah she was definitely very interested in that and i don't think he was so excited that that she was so amped up about it so she was all impressed she's like can i touch the horns and everything like and i think that's word of advice and then like I, honestly it's a, the fair chase hot tip that you know we haven't rolled one of these out in a while but like if you're a single guy and you want to sh like demonstrate your value to a woman, like anywhere in public, maybe it's someone that you're, you've taken a shining to and that you really want to like woo, just get them, go kill a moose in British Columbia and just throw it in your truck and drive around with it. And uh, like, I, I'm telling you, you're going to get the attention that you want and you'll show somebody that like you're rugged, you're manly and like you can provide for, for the family that maybe you'll, you make with this, this girl that you're, you're trying to pick up, you know what I'm saying? Like, Oh yeah. I mean that that's to me the best way to do it. Yeah. I mean, that's just, it's natural. It's in all of us, you know? So you just tap into something real deep ancestral there with those, with that that's big moose right. antler. So real primal. Oh, yeah. They definitely a big ego boost for sure. So <laughs> Jordan's love languages are is words of affirmation or hand signals. I think it was just hand gestures. gestures yeah. For sure. Usually the hand gestures I get on the highway are like a little different yeah. and not so friendly. Didn't get any of those. I was expecting someone to give us to get like kind of crappy or give us the bird or something, but no one did. No, everybody was excited for us. Yeah. You know, I thought when we stopped a couple, especially at, uh, at the stop in Chicago, I thought we were going to get some, some hate language, but no, everybody, everybody kind of just looked from a distance except that one lady. So that was pretty Yeah. Good. Well, and I think the hate language though, like, if you're not a hunter and you're in that area and you see a guy with moose antlers in the truck right in front of you, like, I just feel like even if you don't like it, you're not going to be very rarely are there people that are going to give you guff in the moment to your face, like maybe online where they can't, there's no re like physical repercussions, but like in person, it's just hard to, hard to do the same kind of thing. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So, uh, the only thing, the thing looking back on gear is I, that I wonder about is the, the tripod you carried. You had that head. I mean, I have that tripod was 10 plus pounds, right? Yeah. So that was, that's the big, uh, that's the big hole in my gear list for sure is, uh, is an appropriate tripod for these types of shoots. So, but with my mindset going in, you know, I knew it was a little masochistic bringing that, you know, traditional aluminum photo tripod. It's probably the legs are probably nine pounds, you know, and that's like unheard of, like in backpacking. Uh, and yeah. especially with the video head, you know, that, that alone is another probably like three, four pounds. And yeah, anytime I had that with me, I, I was pretty vocal about how heavy the pack got, <laughs> <laughs> but it was one of those things again, where I wanted when the time came, I wanted to be able to have something that, that was able to get me that shot. And 
especially how this hunt played out. Uh, if somebody was doing the exact same hunt, I might even tell them to to bring that same type of tripod and at least have it in the boat because, you know, we, we were out there in that marsh and I needed to get the tripod up quick and I needed yeah. to be very, very stable because, I mean, it was that my big question was if I'm holding this this camera with a 100 to 500 millimeter lens on it, that's a lot of weight. And sometimes those hunting tripods, you know, they're just holding spotting scopes at the most. And they just cannot support that type of weight. And I didn't want any sort of drift. You know, I needed to set the camera up and make sure the, the moose was in frame and it was going to stay in frame. And I, I could trust that as I stepped away to shoot you. And that's kind of just the woes of, you know, a single, a single shooter out there doing a solo mission. And so it, it sucked definitely carrying that around. And I did not, I did not like it at all. And I only used it that one time, but that one time, I mean, it came in clutch and it was perfect and i mean people will see we got the almost the perfect shot of what we wanted so but i definitely <laughs> well and you set it up in a swamp oh yeah i mean yeah we were you know knee deep in water so again it's one of those things like those sections on this tripod were long enough where you know i wasn't worried about you know like untightening you know small seven section legs it was just something quick i could get up and it was sturdy and, and got it moving definitely left it in the boat uh, once I figured out we weren't going to be using it every single day. So, but it, it's on my list to, you know, to do some more research on, on travel tripods, because, you know, we're talking about doing different types of hunts that have a lot more movement in them. And at that point, you know, I definitely need something, something lighter. Um, but it just goes down to having experience. You know, I, I watch other people's gear lists and stuff on YouTube and, you know, it's good to know, but until you get out there and actually put it to the test, like it's, I never was going to find that out. So, yeah, but again, it, it really comes down to how much are you going to use that, that piece of gear? So I think I could have brought it and just kept it in the boat and then also had a travel tripod on my pack. And if I ever were to need it, that was there. And if we were going to do this big push out into the bush, then I just strap my camera to that tripod and move out. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it worked well. Um, it was heavy, but it was, I feel like it was the right thing for what I will say, you know, you, t you, you mentioned other plans we have. Jordan has a, uh, we're not going to say it now because we're going to just, we're going to be working on it, but he has got a pretty sweet plan for a uh, future goat hunt that we've got uh, going on. We were sitting out there where we were hunting uh, across the creek from us. I mean, we watched dozens of goats very killable uh goats uh while we're sitting there and you had a pretty i mean what, what's cool about you and what i was so excited about having you kind of join us as like the the visual part of our team was um uh you aren't a hunter so you have a you don't you're not like sullied by like the typical hunting media uh and so you you the inspiration or the ideas that you have come from totally outside sources, uh, totally different look at how this should be or could be, or, you know, and you're just very highly trained. So um, very exciting for me because it's totally different. And, and that's kind of what has been our, our thought and how we had wanted to approach filming and telling these stories. So, but all that to say is like, you've got a pretty sweet uh, goat idea that, you know, maybe next year or something like that, we, we work on. Um, yeah. One thing I'll say, uh, go ahead, you have no, yeah, yeah, I was gonna say it's what was cool about that you know that whole idea is it, i think it's so rare especially for like a filmmaker on these types of shoots like these hunts to be in that area where you, where you'll be filming ahead of time like it's just never going to happen and so we're literally in a spot that we could goat hunt potentially you know next year and so as a filmmaker you're in that area and you're looking around and you're like man like i could approach this shoot completely different now that I see it and I can spend time in the area, I mean, we're literally sitting in camp looking at these goats and I, ideas are just moving, you know, but yeah, when, you know, when we talked about BC, it was like, I have no idea what we're going to get into at all. So <laughs> it's kind of just, you, you have no way of really planning. So, so that's why like these big ideas kind of came about. I really hope we can make it happen. I think it's a cool way of a, uh, it's a cool approach to a film and what you're saying where I'm not a hunter, you know, like I'm not oversaturated on hunting films, you know, and I think that's a really good thing, especially for me and my style. You know, I bring a lot of different ideas from other genres to the table and I'm not trying to kind of replicate somebody else's hunting film. I'm trying to present that story in a, in a unique way 
you know, and it might be in a way that somebody else has already done it, but in a, a completely different genre, you know, has nothing to do with hunting, but it's something, it's an approach that I really like. And so I think that's what we have working for us. And it's something that's unique and I would hope it would come across in the film. And I think it really does. So, yeah. Oh man. I am. I cannot wait. I, it's going to be awesome. Everybody's listening. Like keep an eye out. We're going to roll it out in WTA's <clears throat> YouTube uh, channel. And it's, it's going to be, it's going to be something else. Um, yeah. In terms of like even gear lists, uh, I almost didn't bring chest waders. I almost went like muck boots or maybe, you know, if you're going to do a hunt like this and they they say maybe bring waders, just bring chest waders. Uh, we, if we didn't have chest waders with us, that would have been the worst. We would have been soaking wet. It would have been the worst. Yeah. I think that's, that's the biggest lesson from both our last hunts is bring waders along as, as far as you can, unless you're going up into the mountains and they tell you not to bring waders, but man, just pack them, you know? And if, if you don't need them, then that's great. But yeah, that hunt would have been impossible without waders. The other, yeah. So waders, I mean, we're right. And actually like, like, uh, 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 fly fishing waders, like my boots were the guides we were with actually used uh, muck boots over their waders. Um, which was an interesting way. I liked my, my wading shoe boots. They're just lighter. I feel like they're closer to my hiking boots. The only thing that I had trouble with was <clears throat> with waders, you can't like lift your legs up as high. So like climbing up a steep, like, you know, hill or whatever, it just makes it tricky. And, and, um, so it just slows you down. But other than that, it was, I was totally worth it. Two things that I like in just, you know, side, as I'm thinking of gear that kind of came up in my mind that worked really well. One was, um, that two O puffy jacket that I was wearing when I had shot that moose, it was raining and I didn't feel like popping that off because it was cold and throwing a rain jacket on. I just left it on and it started raining pretty hard and I've never had a puffy keep me as dry as that did. I was, other than when I, I, at one point I reached my arm into the water and it kind of went up my sleeve and one of my arms and it got it like my elbow wet. Other than that, no rain came through, which was uh, pretty surprising and pretty awesome. Uh, and the other one was the, uh, that hybrid jacket. It's like, a, it's like, uh, well, the idea it, 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 with it is like the shoulders, the chest, the back are all grid fleece. Um, and then anything that's on your core, that grid fleece is over almost like a, I think it's 60 grams of insulation there. Um, and then under your arms and down the sides of your chest, like the, your, the, your, uh, kind of core is Merino. And so it's like a mix between like a, uh, it's like a hoodie that's both grid fleece and Merino Merino. So you can breathe grid to kind of shed water and, you know, keep a little insulation and, and wind and stuff like that mixed with like a, like a vest, like the, the middle part is like a vest because that's where you get the insulation that I wore. I wore that every single day in, in different spots. And like, I loved it. Um, so just, you know, like we, we, we just partnered with 2O and just kind of working through the gear and putting and just trying it in different areas and, and seeing how it performs. And just, I mean, I've a lot of other great stuff that we use, but like those two pieces stuck out to me this trip, like as hugely helpful um, pieces of gear for me, really, really big fans, fan of both of those. Yeah, man, you were definitely living in those. And I, I think that was the right call. And especially on a trip like that, where you can't bring a ton of stuff because you're taking a, a small float plane out. You know, every piece of gear has to be pretty thought out. I think they worked really well. And I was definitely surprised at that puffy, how long it lasted in that rain. I mean, it wasn't dumping, but man, I mean, it was, it was sprinkling pretty hard and yeah, it definitely, you were dry towards the end of that. So Fair. yeah, I was happy and compared to the guy that we met in camp, you know, hopefully listen to this, Paul, you brought too much gear. Like he kept referring it to, what did he call himself? The Kardashian yeah, was, pack yeah. like a Kardashian. Self-proclaimed Kardashian. He definitely had, he, got he had the... options. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah no. well he gets there and they turn away half of his stuff they're like because he got there before us they're like hey you can't bring this this and this whatever you know they had to like whittle down his gear they unloaded everything and re he had to repack it so we get there and like the back of our truck has like a cooler a freezer a generator and it's covered in tarps and stuff so they get there and they're like oh man guys we're gonna need to cut down your pack and so they assumed that we'd pack like this guy. We're like, actually, our back, this right here is our bag. And it was like a backpack with, and a duffel bag. That was it. They're like, and that included our waiters. That included everything, uh, all your camera stuff. So they were pretty happy to see like 
how much lighter that was and how much easier that made even our flight out um for when we were trying to get out of there yeah i mean yeah because we had such little gear we could throw a moose meat underneath it to get out you know i think that was great i think we packed yeah. too light honestly i probably could have thrown uh, yeah. in a couple pieces that were just you know casual around camp but i i just lived in the same pair of clothes same long underwear and same underwear the entire time like those boots that i convinced you to leave behind and with my crocs i he brought didn't bring crocs he brought boots and so i was like don't bring extra boots like that's too much and you know you probably could have brought them but i out of solidarity i'm like see look at i'll even leave my crocs behind so like we'll both only have one pair of boots with um but looking back like that i could have brought a pillow i use that puffy coat as a pillow which you stuff it into its hood and roll it over and it works great but i could have i have like a little like fluffy like it's really just a regular pillow, but small. So I use it for camping. I definitely could have brought that. Yeah. Hindsight should have brought a better pillow, should have brought camp shoes and <laughs> should have brought alcohol. I mean, yeah, that camp shoes and alcohol for sure. I could have made my pillow was all right, but camp shoes, I will never do a hunt without those again. If there's going to be a camp, there's going to be camp shoes. 100% and the booze like, oh yeah. And the booze. There was some booze there, uh, but you, you you end the night and you have a wall tent. You got like a pretty sweet setup, though. There are grizzlies afoot, as we'll talk about in our next when we tell the story oh, of the boy. hunt. <laughs> but um, but booze would have been nice. Would have been more booze. They had some some uh, whisk. Was it whiskey that they he had? had scotch? Had scotch. I felt bad, yeah. you know, because it was his bottle that he brought, and we I mean we killed it after we shot the moose. But man. Yeah, I, it's just one of those things. That would be a nice gesture to just bring. And even if even if you don't use it, leave it behind. At a camp like that, yeah. I mean, the next team will use it, you know, so for sure. For, for sure, yeah. Well, uh, we're coming up on time here, Jordan. Um, but this is your chance. Like, is there anything we didn't cover that we, like, ideas or things that we should have brought or did bring or, or anything else? Again, we'll tell the hunt soon, but, you know, this is kind of like a – last minute this is gear you know we brought and, and you know i i i'll say a lot of the, i didn't cover everything that i brought there actually is a film on 2o's website uh like a, my moose pack kit like the clothes that i brought um check that out for like my full kit so i won't get into that and the rifle and everything um but like anything else i'm, I'm forgetting about yeah no the one thing i want to touch on that we haven't really said uh you mentioned a little earlier on that you know i was kind of carrying my camera for a majority of the hunt and i i want that to be uh want that to be known because that was a big question I had going in to Alaska was, you know, how often am I going to be holding my camera and ready to be shooting? And so I opted to, to bring that black magic with a top handle and fully rigged out, you know, cinema kit. And that was heavy, but it allowed me to shoot, you know, in a, a documentary sense. And it wasn't, I didn't want to shoot in a vlog, you know, I wanted to shoot that way. So it was, it was yeah. a struggle. It definitely can be done. Uh, but again, I bought that pack specifically for the space it has. So, you know, if it starts getting rainy or we don't need any more shots and we're just moving, I can throw the entire rigged cinema kit in that pack through the top handle there. And then when we stop, I'm good to go. So that was a big, big question for me just going into my first hunt was, you know, how often do we need the camera out? And for me, I decided just to carry it along pretty much 90% of the way. And yeah. I, I think I'm going to, on trips moving forward, I'm going to do the same thing. Like, I don't want to have it in the bag and have to stop you guys and recreate. Like, I want to get ahead of you and film you in the moment and just keep the keep the hunt moving forward. You know, I want it to be as authentic as possible. And for that to happen, you know, your camera's got to be out and ready. Yeah. And, and you, like you, you said, I mean, things happen so fast. It's like, crap, we don't have time. We just got to roll. Even some of the stocks we did, it's like... We got to go. We got to go. We got to go. You know, uh, Dawson's pushing us forward and hauling like at a speed that no non superhuman can go. Uh, and so on. So it's like, yeah, I mean, that was a great, I'm glad you did it. It sucks. And you almost like you have to train for it, you know, going in to, to be ready for that, but well, well worth it. Uh, I completely lost you right there, but yeah, it was worth it. Wor worth carrying that. Oh, for sure. A hundred percent. So I just want to say it, it definitely can be done. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll get into like, you know, when we tell the story a little bit like about the rifle I brought um, and things like that. But um, 
yeah, I, I think that's all I have for now in terms of just last minute prep. It was the big thing was the freezer, the the generator, the the um, some of the key pieces of gear like waders and obviously good base layers and everything else. That's the film I t- uh, I told you about and, and camera gear. So um, if you have questions, if anybody's listening to this doing a, a filmed hunt or they want to get into it or whatever, um, just shoot us a message. You know, I'll, I'll put you in touch with Jordan directly if it's camera stuff or if it's something I can help you with. Part of the reason we do this podcast is like for this, we are figuring it out as we go. We're not by any means um, experts in uh, moose hunting in British Columbia and have done this all the time. It's like it's a new every, every time we're doing something like this, it's a new thing. We've never done it before, figuring it out as we go. And so here to be a resource, at least for our, um, our experience for you, uh, and hopefully we can help you. And hopefully some of this is helpful. So if you have any more questions, let us know, uh, keep your eyes peeled. We'll be doing some uh, different episodes in the next couple of weeks, but pretty soon we'll be sitting down all together and recapping the actual story of the hunt, which was, um, epic to say the least. So stay tuned, Jordan. Thanks for, for joining us today and, uh, looking forward to, uh, telling the story with you pretty here pretty soon. Yeah, man. Glad to do it. Wonderful. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for listening. Go and subscribe. If you haven't done that, go check us out on, on Instagram and social media, uh, the fair chase. You'll be able to find us pretty easy. Anyway, sounds good. We'll talk to you soon.